Hello and welcome to this episode of Bright Blue's Heads Apart. The global coronavirus pandemic has posed an existential threat to the economy and seen a massive expansion in state support, leading to increased interest in the introduction of a universal basic income, a policy idea that would see every citizen receive regular, unconditional payments for life. But would targeted payments reach those in need more effectively? I'm Phoebe Arslanuggage Wakefield, researcher at Bright Blue, and here today to discuss the topic of UBI, we're joined by two fantastic guests Professor of Globalisation and Development at the University of Oxford, Ian Golden, and Chief Impact and Research Officer at the RSA, Anthony Painter. Anthony and Ian, welcome to you both. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, Anthony, public support for introducing UBI was polled at 51% last year. Currently, unemployment is at 5%. It's expected to rise. We have a number of people in poverty and there remain issues with universal credit, what you yourself have termed administrative sludge in the past. Is it the right time to pilot a UBI scheme? We're facing uh, a, a widespread challenge of economic insecurity, which is, of course, related to poverty. Um, and um, inequality. And this, for me, I think is a, is, is a mega challenge. It's a generational or multi-generational challenge that's going to require an array of responses. And we need um, a, a wide range of possibilities in our policy armory. Um, universal basic income is, is, is one um, of the responses to economic insecurity that I think has some possibility. But we need to understand how it operates and how it can help people a little more. And I think trying out pilots in many different ways could give us a bit more of an understanding about the contribution it can make to confronting this this mega challenge of insecurity. But Ian, instead of piloting UBI schemes or many schemes, as Anthony suggests, why shouldn't we just target more money towards the poorest in society? Well, I absolutely agree that we're in a crisis. Uh, Things have got really dire for millions of people in the UK and in other countries. Uh, And the development agenda around the world has been set back immeasurably uh, by COVID-19. We absolutely need to do something. But my own view is that why we'll need to guarantee a living wage for everyone in our societies, universal is not a a good way to go about it. Because universal implies that we're going to give money to everyone. That's what universal means. And if you just do the arithmetic, if you gave everyone in the UK a living wage, that would be more than the entire budget of government. There would be no money at all for the NHS, for education or for anything else. And so then you start saying, OK, we'll give everyone much less than the living wage. And the question is, how much less? And when you do the arithmetic, you see that people that are currently getting even uh, the very meagre universal credit, which is not enough, would be getting less. And the OECD and others have done studies that show this, that if you give everyone money and spread it to everyone, most of who do not need it, you give less to those that do. You end up giving billionaires money. It just seems to me to be ethically wrong. It increases inequality and poverty. It's the wrong way to go about fixing a problem I think we all agree absolutely needs to be fixed. Yes, let's talk about cost. Anthony, how could we afford UBI? Would it mean, as Ian suggests, taking money away from other areas such as health or education? Would it mean the introduction of much higher taxes? And also, how much money would you like to see people receive per month in these pilot schemes? Even a modest basic income would reduce um, inequality and, and poverty. I mean, we We've looked at numbers, as of many others, and even a sort of modest basic income of even £60 a week, which absolutely is not enough to live on. And, you know, the the proposition isn't that it would prevent you having to uh, go to work or even have um, income supplements, for example, if you've got disabilities or you need support with housing. But even a modest basic income of about £60 a week um, would reduce poverty by about uh, 9% and a half destitution. So that's significant in and of itself. And of course, what it does fills in the enormous gaps that have emerged in the social contract, the social security system in the context of COVID. We've seen this. In fact, there was a survey out yesterday um, from the Standard Life Foundation, uh, which showed that four million people, despite lost earnings, have missed out on support for the furlough scheme and the um, self-employed income support scheme. So we have a quilt with holes in. We have, you know, a a trampoline that your, your feet fall through. So it's critical that we address that and we need a big conversation around how to do that. And of course, cost is a major part of that conversation. In order to give the type of basic income that I talked about there, about £60 a week, which would make a significant difference, it would 
close some of those gaps and it would create a bit of a floor on which people could build. Um, you are looking at a, a cost of around 1% of GDP, 20 billion pounds. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but when you put it in the context of changes that are made, for example, to increasing personal allowances or changing the level of corporation tax in the last decade or so, it's kind of in those sorts of proportions, but the benefits are significant. But Anthony, let's say that was introduced and people were receiving £60 a week. I mean, who would be in charge of deciding that amount? I mean, if we consider the politics of UBI for a moment, what's to stop the scheme degenerating into a political football? It certainly will become a political football, but um, because that's the nature of uh, the ongoing democratic discussion about the social contract and, and balance between you know, who contributes and, and who receives. And that's a perfectly healthy conversation to have. But hopefully stepping away from that, and I certainly got this from, from Ian's comments before, uh, we can uh, come together around a collective mission, a collective need, a collective desire to increase economic security um, in society and then think about a range of policies that intersect with one another that can support that. What do you think about Anthony's points, Ian? Are you convinced? No, I'm not at all convinced. I mean, it, it's somewhat of an irony that the only thing that right-wing libertarians and some left-wingers seem to agree on is the need for UBI. And the reason that right-wing uh, libertarians believe in it, indeed many conservatives in this country believe in it, is because they see it as a substitute for other forms of welfare. Um, even if you were to give everyone in the society £60 a week, which I think is a ridiculous idea because I don't want to give the 80% of the population that have much more income uh, than those living in dire poverty, including billionaires and millionaires, £60 a week, you would be increasing inequality because you would be effectively taking from the budget money that would go to other services. The idea that there's sort of an infinite amount of money and that you could add this to all existing uh, redistribution is not what the conservatives that want to do it believe. They see it as a substitute. And it's also not going to be possible from a budget point of view. So it will increase inequality. Of course, no one can live on £60 a week. Why not only give it to the 20% of the population that really need it and give them five times as much, which would be £300 a week? I just don't get the logic in, in saying, let's give everyone £60 a week instead of let's give those that really need it £300 a week. I just don't understand how that can be seen as something that's progressive or would overcome. In terms of experiments, well, there are lots of experiments that have been done around the world. People refer to Alaska, which has a population smaller than Oxfordshire's. People refer to places in Finland that have done it, but none of them have done it in, over a sustained period of time out of budgetary resources. And that's because it's simply unaffordable. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on Ian's point, Anthony? I mean, why shouldn't the poorest 20% receive more money? instead of giving cash handouts to middle-class professionals? We have uh, very few basic income pilots or basic income style pilots in operation, but we have very large-scale pilots in targeted benefits in a number of different areas. Uh, the UK is one of them, actually, and it comes back to the point. Targeting sounds logical. It sounds efficient. It sounds smart. Why would you, why would you disagree? Well, straight away, because once you're into targeting, you're into what I described as administrative sludge, which you quoted at the beginning of the, of the conversation, Phoebe. And that is the bit where it all gets a bit messy. So, um, you know, universal credit isn't meeting the needs of about 4 million people currently, uh, despite um, huge losses of, of income. Um, the rules themselves um, can trip you up. They can create anxiety. And difficulty. The level of effective taxation, which you have to have in place if you're going to heavily target, suddenly means that some of the poorest earners are paying effective tax rates of 70 odd percent or so. So it's starting to look a little less good um, from the perspective of, of the lower paid. And then you have a whole complex array of rules that have to be built into that system. The thing about targeting is that it misses. Universality hits. And we have adopted this principle quite clearly in respect to healthcare. And there's no reason why it can't be applied to economic security at a certain level um, as well. So that's where the argument starts to fall, fall apart. It sounds good, targeting, but in reality, um, it creates uh, a loss of trust, um, a huge complex, complex array of rules that you have to apply by, uh, and perverse incentives um, exceedingly uh, quickly. So a better system is one that balances universality with targeted support through services such as um, uh, skills, support for wages, so on and so forth. 
So Anthony has made the case for universality there, Ian. But what sort of unintended consequences do you think a UBI scheme could have? Could it disincentivize work? Well, firstly, it seems to me like a very poor reason to increase poverty and inequality in the country because you can't get a system together that's going to give money to those in need. It's just, you know, that to me, that seems like a complete cop out. It's like administrative sludge is the reason we need to give everyone 60 pounds rather than the people that needed 300 pounds a week. Um there are lots of ways that you can identify who needs it. You might not be 100% accurate, but you'd be far more effective than giving money to millionaires and to middle class people that really don't need it. The tax system is one way of doing it. You can We know what tax everyone in the country pays. We know who the low income earners are. And you could just say to everyone that's uh, below certain tax th- thresholds, we'll give you £300 a week. But we're not going to give it to those paying at the mar- top marginal tax rates. In terms of the, the negative side effects, there are many. The biggest is that you increase inequality and poverty. I think I have an ethical objection to giving rich people, uh, taxpayers money. I think they should be paying much higher taxes, uh, not being given money, particularly at the cost of giving to those in need. I think it postpones, which is the reason particularly why Silicon Valley believes in this so strongly, it postpones a conversation about the future of work, uh, decent jobs, paying adequately, etc. So it, it's basically being used, particularly by the technology automation robotics uh, groups, as a way of saying, don't worry, we'll basically give everyone UBI, they can stay at home. And It's been shown, and Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winner, has shown this uh, with his fantastic work on the Midwest in the US, that basically, if you don't give people decent jobs, it leads to what he calls the diseases of despair, alcoholism, suicide, depression, crime, etc. And you create a society where you accept, which I think is totally unacceptable, uh, long-term unemployment. I think we need to strive, as was achieved after the Second World War for full employment societies, for decent work for everyone, and where no one in our societies is in poverty and where we overcome inequality through effective redistribution systems. So Ian is concerned that UBI postpones the conversation about the future of work, a sort of of get-out-of-jail-free card for policymakers and business leaders. Do you agree with that, Anthony? No, I'd say the opposite. I'd say, actually, it's part of the conversation around uh, the future of work. Um, and um, how we can move towards a situation. And I completely agree with Ian, by the way. Uh, I, I don't think that is a conversation that should be in any way delayed. Um, in fact, I think we need a di- deeply ethical conversation around what we expect out of our working lives and, and the working lives for all. You know, work gives you a sense of identity and purpose. Um, I think the weight of despair work is... Um, so diseases of despair work is, is critical in this. Um, it gives you a sense of progression in life, of place, um, as well as um, you know, contributing to, to your economic well-being. And it should um, do so more. But basic income is a way of giving you a bit more of a say and a bit more agency and a bit more um, uh, power of your working life. It enables you to try new things. It enables you to acquire skills, enables you to, um, to to move away from work that doesn't fulfill the criterion of, of good work. So I think actually universal basic income is is within the conversation of the future of work rather than antithetical to it. Can I say more, more broadly as well, um, I, I just think we've got to really sort of nail on this point around poverty and equality and um, billionaires getting it and so on. Um, I, I don't think you would find many progressives who would be in any way interested in a policy that was going to increase poverty and inequality. Um, and, and yet it's become one of the um, one of the major, most energetic progressive causes uh, across the world. And that's because actually when you look at it, it doesn't increase poverty and inequality. It reduces it. Billionaires can receive it, but you can tax them more as well. So, Ian, can I have your closing case against UBI? I think Anthony and I agree on the fundamentals that there needs to be a basic income. We want to overcome poverty and inequality. We want decent work for all. Uh, The question is how best to achieve that. And it's the universal word that disturbs me because I cannot see any way in which one can give everyone in society uh, more without 
that leading to those that are really in need getting less. This has been shown by the OECD and many others to be the case. It's really a budget question, but it's also about the focus. And although it is the case that, of course, progressives want to overcome poverty and inequality, there are many groups in society and conservatives who do not believe it's the role of government to do that. And when one goes for universal basic income, so one is basically making a pact across the political spectrum. Many people who have a different vision and see it as a substitute for existing transfers. So both because of the affordability concerns and because of other concerns, I believe there's a real danger. It will erode hard-won gains. And so I'm a strong advocate of basic income and think we should focus it on those that are in need. Well, we've heard the case for and against UBI. Ian, Anthony, thank you very much for your time today. I'm Anwar Saragov, a senior research fellow at Bright Blue. It is no secret that the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic is worsening existing inequalities. Bright Blue investigated the extent of this by examining differences in universal credit uptake across England since the start of the pandemic. We find that there is a clear asymmetric impact with local authorities facing higher deprivation, also being more likely to see larger increases in proportion of people claiming universal credit. London local authorities, many of which are very deprived, have seen some of the highest increases in claimants. And many of the other places that have seen great increase in claimants, such as Blackpool, Hull and Middlesbrough, are coastal towns and post-industrial communities prime targets for the levelling up agenda of the current government. The most deprived areas already required significant support and investment even before the pandemic. The current crisis risks causing them to fall even further behind, especially in regards to employment opportunities. The government should ensure that these areas get sufficient resources pandemic ends to prevent this. Thanks Anvar, and now it's time for Bright Blue MP with me, Joseph Silk, and the Chair of the Education Committee, Robert Halfen. Hello, uh, Robert Halfen, and thank you for joining us for this Bright Blue MP feature. Hello, very good to be here. Thank you for having me. In December 2019, the Conservatives won an election promising to level up across the country. But today, a new report from the Institute for Fiscal Studies has said that pupils in the UK could stand to lose an average of £40,000 each in lifetime earnings as a result of missed schooling due to COVID. And any effects are likely to be concentrated among children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Do you think it's fair to say that there has been a levelling down rather than a levelling up over the past year? Well, very sadly, we've had the four horsemen of the educational apocalypse uh, riding towards our children, pupil and students because of the coronavirus and school and college closures. And we know that uh, there's been a huge loss of educational attainment, uh, a loss of learning. Um, Suggestions are that the gap, the, uh, the attainment gap between disadvantaged pupils and their better off peers could be as much as 75%. We've got a mental health uh, crisis in the offing. You just take one indicator, eating disorders amongst young people have gone up by 400%, partly due to school closures and social isolation. Um, We've got, say, new safeguarding hazards and what the Children's Commission has called invisible Uh, vulnerable children, children who've been exposed to online harms, children who've been exposed to very tough domestic situations at home, children who have been exposed to county line gangs. And the fourth horseman, sadly, is what you have just mentioned, which is the devastating effect that it is having on pupils' life chances in terms of jobs and skills. The school, uh, I'm not a lockdown sceptic, I am a school down sceptic and there is a difference. It has been a a national disaster for our young people. Absolutely. And uh, one of the main problems has, of course, been disparities in remote learning. So research from the Sutton Trust has shown that children's experiences of remote learning has varied substantially across different socioeconomic backgrounds. How can we begin to close this gap again? Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, not only is remote l- learning varied from school to school, I-, I would say this time around it's a lot better. And I salute every single teacher and support staff in schools and colleges who are doing so much to try and keep children learning. But we know that it's varied. We know that uh, two thirds of vulnerable children, even though they're allowed to go to school, are not in school. 
we know that hundreds of thousands of children don't have laptops. So it is really a tale of the haves and the have-nots. So do you put this at the government's door? Have they not provided the laptops? Have they been too slow to let schools know when schools are going to be open, when they're going to be closed, if schools haven't been able to prepare? Well, it has been very difficult because it's been a revolving door of school opening and closure. Uh, It's also um, taken an incredibly long time. The government now have delivered 800,000 plus laptops. I think a million are going to be delivered altogether. They say um, that because there were so many that needed to be ordered, they had to do a big procurement scheme. And the only way it could be done was through national procurement, which inevitably takes a long time. Now, that may be the case. But I, what I would have done alongside the procurement scheme is where there were immediate black spots, I would have given vouchers to schools to perhaps uh, mop up like 15 computers from their local curry store or buy uh, what's called Google Chromebooks, which are, in my view, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm not a Google salesman here, but <laughs> they are a lot easier than Microsoft computers because there's no software that needs to be downloaded there's no virus software you don't need to do anything to the computer you just literally turn it on and it and it works having said all that it's one it's important to recognize the government's laptop scheme which is enormous and i I welcome it but we could have all the laptops in the world but you have to also have uh, and to ensure that the students have the motivation to open the laptops to use them that the remote learning is is quality and is is going on and that the, you have parental support and that is not always the case because parents are often having to work just because you have a laptop doesn't necessarily mean you are learning and the only way we can remedy the gap between the disadvantage and the better off is to get our schools open again sooner rather than later and have and the government to implement the catch-up program the billion plus catch-up program that's been announced yeah in terms of catching up and getting schools open some people have floated the idea of for example cutting summer holidays down so that kids are in school for longer during the summer months would you support something like that i definitely think that um we need to extend the school day Um, But that doesn't mean um, making teachers stay on an extra two hours. I would like the schools to to fund a catch up programme where uh, students in schools could stay for two hours, do a mixture of well-being, mental health activities, sports activities and also um, academic catch up if possible. So who who would deliver these services if the teachers aren't working extra hours? You would have civil society come in and the tutoring groups that the government have uh, funded. So you have the National Tutor Programme at the moment. You would have them come in. I would have sporting groups come in so that it could be sporting activities. I would also have mental health charities because, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're going to face a a mental health uh, crisis with our young people uh, because of what's gone on during the various lockdowns. Mm. Labour have now called for prioritising vaccinating teachers over the half term period. Do you support that? Myself and um, a number of Conservative MPs wrote to the JCVI a week ago um, urging that teachers move and support staff were moved up the priority list for vaccinations. But, and this is very important, which is different from Labour, is that we ask that it be done after the um, all the elderly and clinically vulnerable have had their vaccination. Right, so after the first four priority groups. Yeah, and and the reason for that is because um, I'm not necessarily favouring one cohort over another, workers' cohort, because each workers' cohort has a a case, especially you think of supermarket workers who've been in risking their lives all through the pandemic, looking Mm. after us. But my passion is to get the schools open again, and if it means we can get the schools open sooner it is worth um, getting those vaccinations to teachers and support staff. One of the uh, perspectives from some of the medical officers has been that whilst that is important the problem with schools is that they spread the virus within the community so actually the reason why schools are closed aren't because they're a dangerous teachers necessarily it's because they are vectors for transmission in the community more widely and that's why they say actually although vaccinating teachers might be a good thing it's still better to prioritize people in the community even if it's then lower down the age groups. Well, that's um, interesting because what was t- uh, said to us by the deputy m- chief medical officer, and by the, as I mentioned, I'm not a lockdown sceptic. I voted for all the government measures, so I'm not coming from this from that point of view. Yeah, she said that schools were not major vectors of transmission, and that actually it's adults who give it to children, not children who give it to to adults. And the transcript is there for all to for all to see. And previously, before the most recent strain, 
uh, we were told by the medical officer that it was safe to keep schools open and that school closures had a very marginal effect on uh, transmissions. Now, if that has changed because of the new variant, of course, I listened to the science. Uh, Dr. Jenny Harris appeared before our committee only a week or so ago and, and said this. And, and the Prime Minister himself has said schools are safe. What I worry about is one of the reasons why I'm urging priority for teachers along with other Conservative colleagues, is that um, if a teacher, even if just even if they are not at greater risk than any other profession, thank goodness, which is what the chief medical officer has said, mm. what I worry about is that if one or two teachers are sent home, it means that sometimes year groups or bubbles have to cl- uh, go home or the school has to close. Speaking of Labour, you have voted with the opposition twice now on opposition day debates, first on providing free school meals during school holidays and again on extending the universal credit uplift. Bright Blue has also called for an extension to the uplift. Do you think the government is penny pinching, maybe being a bit miserly over these things? Well, I understand where the government is coming from because they spent £280 billion on, in essence, welfare for the COVID, you know, sums that we, none of us can even imagine. We don't even know what £28 million is, let alone £280 billion. So I understand that they are cautious about spending more money. The reason why I voted in the way that I did in terms of UC was that this is not just any old welfare benefit. It was designed by Ian Duncan Smith, who also supports the uplift. Um, And it was designed to get people out of the poverty trap into work. And because of austerity, the previous austerity, it was pared away. And this restores uh, some of that balance. And all I want to do is it to see um, not just a consolidation of benefits, which it does, but also it to remove the poverty trap. And it helps the lower paid. And the other reason, of course, that I support it is because governments have had to make very tough decisions in terms of shutting down jobs and businesses and livelihoods people have lost you know a lot of money and are struggling and if if government makes those decisions understandably because of covid you can't turn around and then say but we're going to make you suffer even further and make your life harder by uh, taking your income away Absolutely. Finally, I just want to touch on universities. I actually graduated in 2019. I just about dodged COVID during my time at university. Many students feel very strongly that they are not getting the same quality of education, yet they have to pay the same tuition fees, and some are even forced to pay rent on accommodation that they've been told not to return to. There have been rent strikes and petitions. Universities, on the other hand, claim that their resources are as stretched as ever. Do you think that students should be entitled to some form of compensation? Absolutely. I mean, if, if um, I, I think it should be judged by the Office of Students, but and, and everyone has got to understand, to be fair, that because of what's been going on, you're not going to get a full day, a face to face experience, but you need to get a quality blended offer at least. And if you're getting online learning, it's got to be good, high quality. So where the students are not getting good quality online learning or blended learning and um, are not in their halls for long periods of time because of having to go home because of COVID, they should have some kind of compensation. Because if you go, you know, at the end of the day, people are buying the products. It's 9,200 quid plus, a lot of money to take on. And if you're spending that money, then don't you should get what you pay for. I mean, you when you go down to uh, Argos and you buy a computer, um, if, if you only get half the computer, or you get the screen without the keyboard, um, you're entitled to get your money back or get a refund. I suppose the question is, is who would pay? For, because the universities say that, as I said, the, their resources are stretched. They've been putting more money into trying to support students, whether it is through mental health support or whatever else in terms of their response to the pandemic. So they say that, that they don't have the money to refund um, students for lost tuition. I'm not surprised that universities say that. It, I mean, the government are giving extra funds to universities, um, I, I mean, I think that's why I think each case should be judged by the Office for Students. Um, and I would be very interested to, to see where I, I think if, if cases were judged by the Office of Students, you'd actually start to see where students don't feel they're getting an improvement. You would get an improvement and you could do it by perhaps offering the student discount off their loan the following year if they had further years to go. There are different ways of compensating. Of course, I understand universities are not going to say that they're going to say they haven't got the money. But if they're not providing the product, uh, they they need to there needs to be some kind of discount or recompense to the student. Very interesting thoughts. Chair of the Education Committee, Robert Halfen MP. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this edition of Bright Blue's Heads Apart podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, 
Don't forget to like it, share it and subscribe. Thanks for listening.